Good morning, Mets fans, and welcome to a Monday edition of Driving with Mr. Met. I am Mr. Met, and today I am wrapping up my 40-man roster spectacular. <laughs> uh, over the last couple of shows, I've talked about the 40-man, uh, and I've left the most difficult um, for last, and that would be the bullpen. So I'm going to talk about the bullpen today, but I also want to touch on, before I get there, uh, some of the new pace of play initiatives that uh, and, and other things that MLB is coming out with, um, talking about last week, and I didn't really discuss them, so I want to touch on those a little bit today and um, talk about a revelation I had on Friday pertaining to pace of play. The latest proposals from MLB um, was, uh, was was made were made last week, I should say, and. Uh, one of the one of the key items on that list was the universal DH, and um, I I got to into a conversation about this with a couple of coworkers who are baseball fans. They're Phillies fans, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but we talk a lot about baseball at the office, and uh, we were talking about you know this proposal. And I think I mean I, I've I've been on the record for a while. I'm not a fan of the DH. Um, I feel like the designated hitter just completely castrates the manager's necessity to even be a part of the game. Um, you can, I mean, you can literally sleep through a game if you are managing an American League team. I'm sorry, it's just, there, there is so little that goes into managing an American League team uh, in season, in game. Um, you know, your, your job then at that point is just to get your team ready to play and that's it. Uh, so I've, I've never been a big fan of the DH, but I think we can all agree it is coming to the National League. There's, there's no question about it. <clears throat> what I found to be funny about this was that, uh, like, two weeks before spring training is about to start, they propose the Universal DH. Uh, like, how about give the National League teams more than two weeks to decide, oh, shit, we have to dedicate one of our roster spots to a powerful offensive player who can't play the field. Not to say there's not lots of those guys out there, but, I mean, roster construction changes significantly. Um, even drafting changes significantly. So there's there's a lot that has to be thought out about the DH being adopted by the National League. Uh, I'm never going to like it, but I do expect that it's coming. So uh, I wanted to mention that as, uh, as something that came up last week, and I wanted to touch on it real quickly. In the same conversation I had with my coworkers, we were talking about pace of play. And... You know, we, we all kind of feel the same way about this. Like, there, stop trying to change the game. The game is beautiful and fantastic and should never be changed, right? And I'm, I'll forever say that. Um, making rule change, you know, it's interesting, making these rule changes to make the game faster, um, it doesn't make sense to me because, look, the games weren't slow 25 years ago. They weren't, and I don't even think they're slow now. I'm just saying the games didn't take as long to play. I think that's the more appropriate way to refer to it. So games didn't take as long to play 25 years ago. They didn't have different rules then, right? So I got to thinking, like, what's the major? What's been one of the major changes in baseball over the last 20, 25 years that's padded all these games? I mean, you can talk about TV rights and commercial breaks and, and everyone sponsoring everything. And that might be part of it. But I think the bigger issue is the size of the ballparks. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about the, the home run ball, although that has significantly increased. No, I'm talking about foul territory. Um, when you think about foul, what foul territory used to be in the cavernous stadiums like the Vet and like the Astrodome, um, and then you compare that to the foul territory in, and I'll stick with the same two cities and the same two teams, Citizens Bank Park and Minute Maid Park. The foul territory is ridiculous. It is, it is to the point now where when a ball is hit up, is it, when, is, when a ball is popped up in foul territory, it, it's almost not even discussed as a possibility to be caught. And if you think that doesn't impact how long the game goes, you don't understand baseball. I can remember back to John Main, who, you know, in, in the mid-2006, 2007, um, was a guy who could not put batters away. I remember just guys fouling balls off left and right and left and right off of Main. He just couldn't put a batter away. And I can't imagine how much worse it would have been for him now when there's low foul territory. I mean, you think about how many balls go up in the air and are six, seven rows back field level 
and you've got the first baseman and second baseman pursuing the ball for no reason because they, there's no way they can make a play on it because any ball that's hit up in the air significantly is traveling in that direction. It's going to end up in the stands. And you go back 20 years ago, that ball was caught. So think about it this way. If that ball gets caught on the third pitch that the pitcher throws to the batter, the pitcher doesn't throw any more pitches to that batter. That batter is retired. That batter doesn't have a chance to continue that at-bat and make the pitcher throw six, seven pitches in that at-bat. Go, so on and so forth, etc., etc. Pitchers go deeper into games with more foul territory and more foul outs. Games go faster because outs are recorded more quickly. I just, I think that is as big a culprit as as anything as to why baseball is taking longer today to finish a game than ever before. And I, I, I don't know what the statistics are on it. I didn't do any research, but I'd love to see what kind of. Uh, sort of like overlays there could, there could be to show like a ball that landed out of play versus a ball that would have landed um, not in the stands, you know, you know, one stadium to the next. I'd love to look at it for just for Citizens Bank Park and the Vet, just as the example, because those are just two polar opposite parks, and I'd love to see what that looks like. So I might start doing a little bit of independent research on that and see what I can find. Uh, but, you know, that was my revelation on Friday, and I, I was kind of proud of myself for thinking of it, so... Uh, I'll move on now and get to the bullpen, which, interestingly, as I said before, is, is probably the most difficult thing to predict. Um, and, of course, I, I let, left myself with, like, five minutes to do it. So, of course. Uh, so, let's, let's, let's jump into the bullpen. So, we've, we've, narrowed, down, um, we've narrowed down the uh, starting rotation. So, obviously, there's five there and there's eight men uh, on the field. So five starting pitchers and eight men manning the, the eight positions, eight defensive positions. So that's 13. Um, last week I talked about the bench, and I, I was sort of tossing up between four and five. And so that lends itself to how many guys are going to be in the bullpen. So it could either be, um, it could either be seven or eight. Uh, you know, seven-man bullpen or an eight-man bullpen, and then that will fluctuate with the bench being four or five. But let's work for our way from the back to the front because that seems to be the easiest way to do this. We know that Edwin Diaz is going to be the closer. We know that Jerry Familia is going to be the setup man. We know that Justin Wilson is going to be a part of the bullpen. And, of course, we know that Seth Lugo and Robert Kazelman are part of the bullpen. Those are sort of five sure things, barring injury and or a complete meltdown in spring training. So those five guys are going to be there. So that leaves two or potentially three slots to fill. So I was looking at the 40-man roster, and um, both Yoana Cespedes and Franklin Kilome are on it right now. Uh, both of them will be moved to the 60-day DL, I presume, at the start of the season. So that'll free up two roster spots, and I think one of them is going to be claimed by Luis Avilan. I have a good feeling about Avilan going into spring training. He is not currently on the 40-man, but as I said, with those DL moves, it will free up two spots for Avilan to claim one of them. And I do expect Avilan to then be that sixth man in the bullpen for the Mets. So <clears throat> that leaves either one or two spots to fill. And boy, this gets tricky because there are a lot of names uh, it, looking at, at those last two spots. I'm not going to predict who because it, it's anybody's guess. But you have the list of uh, Drew Smith, Tyler Bachelor, Jacob Rame, uh, Daniel Zamora, Daniel Don't Call Me Pedro Zamora, um, Tim Peterson, uh, Hector Santiago, who's also not on the 40-man, but is another potential bullpen guy. Everyone's favorite, Paul Seawald, uh, is still around. I mentioned Jacob Rame, another perennial favorite. Uh, so there's lots of names that, and I'm missing some, I'm sure, but there's lots of names, Drew Gagnon or Gagnon, whatever, um, uh, there's lots of names, uh, is my point, that can compete for the, the final one or even potentially two spots in the bullpen. Uh, it'll be, just be interesting to see how spring training determines who those guys are going to be. And that's, that's what's going to end up happening with this bullpen. And it's interesting. I thought this was a, a real weak spot of the team. And it might be. Um, but as I think more about it, the depth is there in terms of the numbers. I don't know that the depth is there in terms of the quality. And it leads me back to what I said last week about the starting pitching. Beyond the, st the starting five, there's not a lot of depth there. And I'm talking about not only is there not a lot of depth in quality, there's not even that much depth in quantity. So the Mets do need to go out and, and acquire some starting pitching depth. 
Um, I, I keep leaning toward Gio Gonzalez just because he's still available. Um, he is a lefty, of course, and I don't know how he's going to fit, if he's going to accept a minor league assignment. I, I have no idea, but I just, you know, the Mets starting pitching remains the biggest concern for me, um, which is odd considering that the starting five potentially could be so good, and I guess we could take Vargas out of that, but the starting four, at least, could potentially be so good. It's still the biggest Achilles heel for this team. So I was a little bit surprised and pleasantly surprised at what the bullpen is going to look like uh, as I just went through it today. What do you guys think? Am I missing someone? Did I forget to mention someone in the pen? Uh, is, there, is there an exciting arm that, uh, that, I, that I'm, I'm glancing over? Let me know either in the comments below or on Twitter at Mr. Underscore Met. So that'll wrap it up for today. Uh, that wraps up the 25-man roster that I think the Mets will bring to uh, to uh, opening day. Um, it's going to change, of course, and uh, injuries are going to happen in spring training, and guys are going to prove themselves in spring training and get promoted as a result. We'll just have to see what happens. The good news is that officially spring training starts tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. Uh, it was awesome watching videos all weekend from uh, PSL, and I just I can't wait for the season to start. So... Um, thanks for tuning in all of these off-season months. The regular season is just around the corner, but spring training is even closer. And that means there's going to be some games to watch. And that just cannot wait. Cannot wait. So, until then, and it'll be soon. Thanks for watching. I'll be back later this week to talk about something. I don't know what. But until that time, as always, let's go Mets.